Okay, well, hello everyone. I think there's still some people coming in, but yeah, we'll get started. So today we're going to be talking about migrations. And this is the one thing that we like to do uh, before we start a presentation on any topic, is to ask, well, why? Why would you want to migrate? And in the case of migration, the opposite question, why wouldn't you migrate, is actually a very good question because you have a website. It works, it's functional, why would you want to migrate? And, well, sometimes you don't need to migrate. You don't always need to migrate. Some, sometimes you can just leave your website as it is, or sometimes, well, as you mentioned yesterday, you, you can also just shut it down and that's the end of it. Um, but sometimes you need to migrate. And Yanis found this, this quote um, from a, a general, I think, who wanted to He's stop. A, politician. Hmm? a Russian politician. A Russian politician uh, who wanted to stop uh, bird migration and no, you cannot do that. It's impossible. And in the same way, when you need to migrate, you know that you have to migrate. Um, so if you're stuck with a system, this could be an enterprise preparatory content management system, it could be an old platform that's unmaintained. When you need to migrate, well, you just have to migrate. It's a natural thing. And well, when you can't migrate or when you really have to, well, it kind of feels like being in prison. The most famous prison is, of course, Alcatraz, which gave its name to, to, our, uh, to the title of our session. On our escape from Alcatraz, we have two fellow criminals here to, to assist you on this way, on this way out. So, hello everyone. My name is Florian Lauritan. I'm a software architect at Wunderkraut, Germany. Yeah, and I'm Yanis. Uh, I'm a, a developer in Wunderkraut, Latvian office. So, please welcome to our criminal session. <laughs> and now, let's get started, not with the way it is now, but with things, well, what are the different ways that people have done migrations before? And actually, we took it in a way, let's, let's, we took it in a way, really, we looked back to the history, how people actually migrated uh, away uh, or to some things. And we looked back really, really far away in the history. And then we actually looked back, you know, back in the days, about 4,000 years ago, people had some writing. So they basically they were writing things not in the computers or on paper, they were writing things on stones. So you had to do a pretty heavy stuff. So you had to rely on quite reliable animals. And firstly, we use donkeys, mules, and camels to migrate things from one place to another. People used to migrate data. Right, we moved on, and then we, uh, we became clever, so we invented typing machines. That's a great way to migrate. The next thing, when we became more clever, we actually started to use more clever options, things like copying and pasting. Has anyone done this? No one? <laughs> it, it's, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, fine, yeah, you're great people. <laughs> We're starting copying and pasting. A friend of mine copied a book of 2,400 pages from a web page to an Excel spreadsheet. So, it's just for your inspiration. <laughs> if you can't get things done, go back to old days. Right, if we move to the next stage, we probably have raised so big in our organization, so we don't have time to do this copy and paste thing. So what we do, we hire somebody. Well, actually, we don't hire anyone. We just <coughs> say somebody that we are going to hire that person, and at the end, we just say, I'm sorry, we, we don't have budget, you will be unpaid. So, And we'll give you this wonderful option to be in an intern in a massive, big organization. We don't do that, but some do. Uh, if we go further to the, more to the direction we want to talk about later, then uh, obviously we start to move things into various sophisticated systems, things like Drupal. And then when we moved to Drupal, when there were no day, when back in the days we didn't have any migration support kind of maintained and stuff like that, we used to do a custom script. Yeah, if you can read it, if you can read it thoroughly, you'll get a chocolate from me. 
Right, this is my own creation, my own script. The, it went very well, by the way. There are about 1,500 items, files and, and some, some texts. It went well, but it had no backwards compatibility. By that I mean it had no rollback options. So you created nodes and they were kind of stable, stubborn. And finally, this is the thing I mostly like. I've done, many, I've done this many times before I actually start to do things in a more clever way. This is into, insert into statements. Has anyone done this? One, two, three, four, ten. Do insert into statement and don't be afraid. We this don't is weird. Be, yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid. You can be honest here. Uh, yeah, we used to do insert inserts, by the way. If you, you can create, this, by this you can create users. You can take users from some weird database or a system of tables and just put them into a Drupal database system. For instance, this is Drupal 7. Good. Uh, since we've covered the history, we will now see how to do things in a proper way, in a Drupal way. Let's go ahead and look at the, the way how we can do it. Yeah. So, in the modern Drupal ecosystem, there are two main modules that can help us with migrations. Most popular one, I would say, is the migrate module. It is the one that we will focus on mainly today, but it is worth mentioning the feeds module, which is also an alternative. The migrate module and the feeds module work in different ways, but you can do pretty much everything with both of them. Um, but they have very different direction, different approaches to the, the migration, uh, well, to the task of doing a migration. The migrate module is really about migrating all the data from uh, an obsolete system that you really want to get rid of. You get all the data out and you put it in your system, leave the, the old one behind. The feeds module is more about synchronizing synchronizing data between an old environment and a new one. It works well to do that, and you can actually do a migration as a synchronization, or you can do a synchronization as a migration, um, but it, I think it's important to, to know what kind you're doing, and if you want to do a synchronization, maybe have a look at feeds. If you want to do a migration, look at the migrate module, and this is the one that we're going to talk about today. So no matter which one you use, <coughs> migration always has three basic steps. The first one is to get your data out of the old system, then to do some processing of the data to make sure that it matches the, the format that you want to have, and then you want to save that data somewhere. So you have a source, some mappings, and then you have a destination. In our example of getting out of prison, not uh, the legal way. First, you dig a hole, you get out. Then you have some transformation. That's where most of the work happens. Crawling, running, swimming as fast as possible. And then you want to make sure that this stays the way it is, so you change your identity or something like that. I'm not an expert. <laughs> In terms of doing this as an actual migration from an external source to a Drupal website. Well, for example, we could be importing from a CSV file or from a SQL database. So the first step is really to get the data. The second step is to figure out how the old data will be mapped to the new data, and then we actually want to save the, we want to save the, the node or the user or anything that we want to save in the Drupal system. And here, it's very interesting to, to see this separation because it makes it very clear why it's helpful to use a system like the Migrate module. We have sources, we have destinations, and we have the mapping. The sources, it's generally something very common. A CSV file, a SQL database, an API from some external system, the destination, it's also very common. It's an entity, it's a node, it's a file, it's something like this. And the only part that really, where the business logic lies, the thing that's really project specific, is a step in the middle. And when you use the migrate module, for example, you can actually reuse an existing source, an existing destination, and just focus on the mapping part. So how does it work? 
here's an example. Well, actually, the migrate module itself has a very good example module. And it's an example that migrates beer, that creates uh, beer nodes. The thing, though, is that it only has three different kinds of beer, and I don't think that this is relevant. And especially being in the Czech Republic, we thought that, you know, three beers, like we've already had more than three different kinds of beer at the bar. So we want to have something that's more relevant. So we found a website that documents uh, Czech beer. And um, as you can see, it's a beautiful website, modern web design, fully responsive. Um, at, but it could use a migration. So, <laughs> and so we, what we did in this case, we did a copy paste and we put this in a spreadsheet, which we exported as CSV file. This was the only copy and pasting in, uh, step involved in this, in this example. And then we decided to create a module. So the migrate module it is a module, but it does not do any work for you. So it does not declare any migrations. It declares the tools. And in order to use a migrate module, you have to create your own module, which will build on top of the migrate, uh, the migrate framework. So here, it, this is just the info file. Nothing special about, uh, about this. We depend on the migrate module. And we have an include file, which, uh, which I'll get to in just a second. So there's a module file, the my module name dot module. This one stays empty. You don't need to have anything in there. The migrate module, well, a migration really happens in a, it's a separate thing. It does not happen while your website is running. It's a separate step. So for this, we have a separate include file, the module name dot migrate dot inc. And there we implement hook migrate API. There's two things that we need to define first, the version of the API that we want to use. This is pretty self-explanatory. And then we want to define a list of the migrations that we want to do. So one specific migration in this case would be, I want to import content from, of this type. I want to import users. I want to import a list of breweries, for example. So we define this, and we, d we just indicate the class name. This class is going to be in a separate include file, which we included in our info file. And here we just extend the base migration class from the migrate module. There's one, only one method that we need to override from, base, uh, from the base class. It is the constructor. So we just override the constructor, call the parent constructor first. And everything else that follows is happening inside of the constructor. First step, we just give a, a good description. I think check beer is enough in this case. Not very descriptive, but it works. The second step is to define what other migrations need to happen before this. So typically, if you want to associate nodes with users, you would migrate the user first and then when you import the nodes, you attach nodes to the proper users. In this case, well, we could have had an example with, well, you want to improve, uh, import breweries first and then import the beer, something like this. Uh, this is the place where we would have done it. But in this case, nothing. Uh, nothing needs to be done. One more thing that we need to do is we need to establish a mapping between the old pieces of content and the new pieces of content to figure out what, are, what were the, the identifiers in the old system and what are they in the new system. This is also something that's really important so that we can roll back the, the content that we imported so can, we can test uh, the, the, the import multiple times. And the migrate module has a helper class that pretty much does all the work for this. Uh, we just give it the ID of the old system the IDs in the new system, and it just goes ahead and creates a table and establishes the mapping uh, as the as the migration gets gets run. <coughs> now we get into the part that I talked about before. We have a source and a destination. We're going to start with the source. In this case, we have a CSV file, so we just indicate where the CSV file is located 
in on the file system, and we define explicitly which uh, which columns are available in the CSV file. You can also use the headers from the CSV file that works too, but sometimes it's better to define things formally so you know exactly what to expect, you know exactly what IDs you're going to have. And well, and then we just add um, the, the source to, to our migration. Same thing for the destination, but this time it's even simpler. We just want to save this into node types, uh, into nodes of the type beer, which we have defined previously. And this is the only thing you need to do to set the destination. Now comes the mapping, not the mapping between individual pieces of content, but really about the fields available on these pieces of content. So in this case, we want to map the columns of the CSV file that we are importing to the fields on the nodes that we want to create. So this is something that we can do in code. And this is also something that you can do through the user, inter uh, the user interface starting with the, the 2.6? 2 .6. 6. 2 .6. So this is, it's a, it's a release candidate at the moment. So if you just do Drush DL migrate, you will not get this version. Uh, but it should, be, it should be out soon. And if you explicitly want this one, you can definitely get it. It's very stable. And here you can set the mapping, not through code, but through user interface. So if you're a developer, you will not get a huge advantage of that. Um, but what is very nice is that, well, this mapping is something that really often requires input from the customer. And Yanis will talk a little bit more about that later. But having a user interface like this actually makes it possible to take this into the meeting room and say, well, you have this and where should, what should this be mapped to? And you can really have a conversation uh, with your customer through this user interface, this is, not some, uh, this is not something that you can do with uh, writing code. And finally, through a user interface, you can also select a migration, tell it to, to import, and here we see 16 beer types were imported, not very much, but for example, it works. So as a proof that it works, we've actually, we have functional code that this, uh, does this. This is the same data exported uh, from the from th that web page into a Drupal website. All the nodes were created, no copy pasted in involved in the migration itself. And of course, you also have a Drush command that can run the migrations, can roll back the migration. All the operations that you can do in the front end, you can also do them through the command line interface via Drush. And this is very helpful not because, well, it's cool and you can use the command line, but this is something that you can trigger as part of a script, like a deployment script, or a continuous integration script. Um, or if you want to have something that runs regularly, you can also uh, use a cron job. So this is a very, very powerful tool, and you can really integrate this into much bigger workflows. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the less technical aspect, but just as important, if, if not even more important, planning and collaboration before the migration happens. Uh, as we, as uh, Florian just demonstrated, the, the migration module itself, it's quite easy to set up things. You can set up field mappings, uh, use various sorts of SQL, CSVs, and things like that. But if you move to more sophisticated systems, you get maybe more data, or you get more sophisticated data stored in many columns or many databases you would definitely need to go a couple of steps before you actually start to do any coding or even starting about thinking about coding. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and move to a very important subject, planning. And I've noted myself down uh, from the experience what things you have to go through and what I would recommend to go through before you actually move to any coding, creating modules, or, or maybe thinking what to do. Uh, first thing, field mapping. Uh, you showed an example, it's easy to do in terms of an interface and the programming, but field mapping here, I mean, you have to agree with your customer which fields go where. You sometimes can have not, like we had five, five or six columns. Yeah, five or six columns. That's, that's not much, that's really easy. But if you, you can have sometimes 10, 20 multiple columns. You may need to join other tables. 
So the system you create at the end, it needs a really, really thorough look through it and just make sense to discuss it, which builds, in order to agree with a customer what is the end result he wants to see. This is an initial thing you have to do. You have to do field mapping. The, one of the easiest things, you just create a spreadsheet and you, if customer has given you some data, you create a selection of fields you can offer from the source and a sexual action of fields you have developed on your Drupal project. And then you just go to a meeting and agree which fields go where. You can use the same interface we've just demonstrated. Second important thing is time when, when you do migration. It really matters. Sometimes it, your migration is a crucial part of your work. You are, the, the way how your project is set up, you're not able to do any further work if you haven't done migration, if you haven't pulled the content from somewhere. So it needs to be planned when, how. You need to discuss with the customer things like what systems and, and stuff like that, what time. Maybe the sites, the project sites, they're not allowed to have a massive downtime. They can have only very short periods. You can switch off the site. And think various things like that. So plan it, when, agree on that. Uh, amount of quality of legacy data, third, another crucial aspect. First thing, amount, so how many, how much data you have. The type of data, whether there are files, whether there are Files like, by files I mean images, documents, PDFs, etc., etc. The amount of data, how, ma how many are those files, or how much rows you have in your database tables you want to migrate, or how, much, how many rows you have in your CSV file or XML file. You need to go through them and just see. Data quality, the fourth one. Uh, Florian will demonstrate you an example about not the best source data quality. But these things can happen. So be, make sure that your, the data quality, you are satisfied as an organization, as an implementa implementation organization, the one who implements the site, does the migration in your workflow. Make sure that you are kind of less, more or less satisfied with the quality of data. Any weird character sets, we will talk about uh, character encoding and things like that. They have to be whether removed or encoded, decoded, or whether just discussed with a customer that they might be some issues. And migration workflow, that's, that's a crucial import. All those five steps, this is your workflow. When to do and how to do and things, why to do. And uh, in my example, a little bit later, I'll demonstrate why it matters. The next thing, collaboration. This is a crucial thing because when you migrate, this is like, anyone can imagine, it's like a building a house. You built a house and you have various stages. You, the, the initial stage, you have to set up your fundament, all the Concrete works, you had to dig the pipelines to make sure that the electricity is there, all the, the wired networks and things like that. But your client, he doesn't see actually the result. You just do something. You do lots of mess, some other things like that. So there should be some collaboration involved. You should demonstrate to your customer what's going on, why it is important and things like that. And by the way, in about I don't know, 95% of cases, customer will not use the end result of your work. By that I mean the, your, code, your code will not be reused. So collaborate between team developers. You can, do mul you can work concurrently on the same tasks. You can have multiple migrations. One person can do a work on one migration, other can do the other one. Collaborate. So what dependencies you need? Which should go first? With clients, always try to demonstrate them. As long as you're ready with just a simple part of migration, try to demonstrate them so it works to build trust. Workflow integration. Again, try to integrate within your project's workflow. Try to understand where you are, why you are, how to do it, what, when it's the best time to do it, and things like that. And uh, yeah, those are kind of three basic rules for your correlation. And uh, let's now go ahead and move to a more interesting part. Let's look at some examples of our things we've done. Uh, mine is first. This is just recently finished. And uh, this is the one which I can't show you because the work is still going on. We've done the migration, but the work is still going on. This is our workflow. So I can't show you, but I'll just go through. This is a Swiss Red Cross website. About uh, 1,500 uh, nodes and about the same amount of files we migrated. Maybe not a big figure, but uh, it was pretty interesting and uh, quite And it was migrated from TYPO3? Yeah, it was migrated of, of systems of TYPO3 mixed together with various custom builds. 
So actually, if you look at table systems or the dumps we received from a customer, you didn't have any prefixes typical to typo systems. They were just some tables. And uh, the way our customer wanted to be them displayed in various ways. So you got the, those 50, 1,500 rows, about 35 columns, and he wanted to pull the data. He wanted to create entities, file entities, nodes, node types, different things, taxonomize them and things like that. It has to be done via migration. It had to be done, sorry. Nevertheless, and what was the interesting thing, customer knew Drupal, so he knew possibilities of Drupal. I don't know why, maybe he read lots of blogs about the migration, but he knew very well that that's possible. So he knew Drupal, in the same time, we were always getting the quick feedback. So anytime I, I send him some, some query, some message, I don't understand your, your, what you're saying to me, or I'm not fully sure whether this has to go there or whether this has to be categorized, it was so easy to work with him. Easy, easy feedback, he spoke perfect Drupal language. Perfect Drupal language, he understood everything. Uh, customer had supplied us field mapping, so we just created a small spreadsheet, having you, what, a, what did we just stop? You had a list of fields we have in a source, you had a list of fields we've, we've created based on your specification, and can you please just add a third column and give us what you wanna see? If you did that, a reusable meeting notes, perfect thing. He created a taxonomy categorization. By, so how I was able to make them reusable, so what I did, I downloaded that small, really small spreadsheet as a CSV file, and I created a parser which just parsed the data in that CSV, and that gave me the categorization of items. Because sometimes in the source you may not get the data you want to see in the destination. So there is, an, uh, there is a possibility for you to apply some callbacks and function which you can parse the data and then put it back to a system. And obviously, uh, based on all this, we built an initial trust and a very, very good communication. It's kind of, he responded so quickly. There were no emails at all. We chatted on a Skype mostly, so nice and easy work. And uh, I think next one is a bit more mm -hmm. interesting. <laughs> yeah, a bit more data. Um, yes, so th this is for a different project. We were not migrating from a website, but we were migrating um, from a, a commercial database. So we needed to have a list of all commercial addresses in Germany. That's about three and a half million uh, addresses with metadata. Uh, and it's a lot of data. So we, we ordered, uh, when, when we bought this, uh, the place where we, we bought it, they said, okay, it's going to be there in three days. And they're like, why, why does it take so long? Like, well, that's the, time it takes for the mail to deliver the DVD. Like, okay, that's, um, so j just for a reminder, this is what a DVD looks like. So it's a, it's a round disk that stores data and it can be a good amount of data. Um, so it's three gigabytes, over three gigabytes of text data. And this, I mean, it's a CSV file, so relatively standard format, but Excel can't open it because it's too big. No, no, <coughs> No uh, Excel alternative can open it. Um, and, well, it's also too big for, uh, for PHP to open the file at once. So the only way to do this is to go through chunks. And by default, the migrate uh, CSV source does not do that. So we, we ended up just killing our web server, uh, well, local environment, but, uh, but still. Uh, trying to do that in Portland. There's actually a quick trick, which I will get to. Um, but there's one, well, a couple more issues. It's, um, well, the the import, well, when you import 100 items, or what I showed in my examples, you see exactly how many milliseconds it took. And this is very important, because originally we wanted to import the data. We also had a separate source for logos for each of the companies that we wanted to represent and we wanted to save the files and we realized that at the speed uh, at which things were going it would have taken two and a half months of just letting the script run if we wanted to migrate all the data um, so this you know the, the the time it takes and how many you get uh, how many items important per second or per minute this is very important information because if you have a lot of data, it's going to matter. And in the end, well, we ended up making some compromises, uh, separating the logo import from 
the from the the just plain text import and we were able to optimize this to run into well in 20 minutes so it's still a good amount of time but it's still a lot less than 20 uh, than over two months and also the file was encoded as um, as a Windows 8 um, encoding. Um, and so all the special characters, all the accents, which of course matter a lot in Germany, well, they, they were all messed up. And so we, it's pretty easy to fix. You just need to fix the file encoding before you import it. But it, this is really something that you have to notice while you are testing the import, because there is really no way to, to, te to fix it later. Um, well, there are ways, but it's really you, you really don't want to be doing that. So it's it's very important to recognize text encoding issues first and um, and really be able to address them. Um, when you want to migrate a very big data source, and this applies to the CSV source, but also if you want to migrate a lot of data from from a SQL file. Uh, well, from a SQL database and you want to make a query, if you query for everything, it's also not going to work that well. So what you want to do is, in, well, and the thing that, that actually causes the problem is that when you try to import a CSV file, uh, the migrate module will try to figure out how many lines are in there. And the way it does that, it goes through every line and just counts them. So if you have a lot of lines, like over three millions, then it will just run, continue until it runs out of memory. Uh, so what you really want to do there is to just say, well, I know how many, how much data is in there, more or less, and I, well, don't count them. Just go through it. And uh, th there is this skip count parameter that you can pass to any any source, and it actually makes it work so that you can really advance chunk by chunk, and it works really well. Now we have one more example. And lucky to you, this is live. You can see this website. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, quite an interesting. Well, it's a property website. Just there's I not fully understand what it does. You can sign up, you can uh, post your ad, and then others can rent it. So it's a fairly interesting system. And this is an example of migrating from one Drupal to another one. It's kind of, we are, we heard a dry speaking about the Drupal 8, so I think there will be a pretty interesting subject in the next six, seven months, how to migrate from old Drupal systems to new. And this is exactly an example. This is Drupal 6 to Drupal 7. Uh, not kind of a straight migration site had to be redeveloped, so it's, it's a different, completely different look what it was to. So, uh, yeah, I think we faced a couple of challenges, a couple, but... Uh, it was a sophisticated list of destination fields. The way our customer wanted to display and the way here we wanted site to work, we had a lots of fields in various formats. We had a lots of field collections, which is one of the uh, challenging situations in the migration. We had a lots of entities creating when the node gets saved and things like that. It was, people don't do that these days, but this was a requirement, Ubercart to Ubercart migration. So two to three. Uh, we did that, yes. We, we, it was a challenge in the first instance because Ubercart, it doesn't kind of comply to any typical Drupal way. It just, it's kind of an entity, but in the same way, it's a custom table. So it's kind of, you don't know what it is, but you can do. There was lots of custom entities, as I mentioned already, creating, getting created when, the, when, when you create and when you add a new property, let's put things through, uh, kind of, as they are, uh, if you create an entity, a lots of other entities are created. Lots of messaging system, then the messages are stored in a table, then they're getting emailed and things like that, various stuff. Uh, long setup process, yeah, it was really long and painful to set it up. Unmaintained files, it was the most funniest thing. So we had files, as you know, Drupal stores managed and non-managed files. Managed files are the ones which Drupal keeps the file path is in the database system so you can easily find them. You just run a query and just hope that the files exist actually in the file system. But we had a lots of unmaintained files. And unreliable data sources. So uh, they were, in terms of the columns were a bit different. Uh, the data stored in a Drupal 6, obviously the data was different from the way it should be stored in Drupal 7 and things like that. 
Right, and uh, I'll go through a couple of code examples, how we resolve them. First thing, Drupal, this was done with the help of another module, which is a really great one. It's called Migrate Drupal to Drupal. It's a yeah, helper one if you want to migrate in between Drupal uh, releases. And the way you do it, it's a bit easier way. Uh, this is taken from the example module, which is in the Drupal Migrate to Drupal, Drupal to Drupal Migrate. Uh, the way you apply it, whenever I flush caches or caches, then it just runs through my register, migration register, and checks whether there is something new. Uh, you can do it anyway, but that was just a convenience thing for us. Uh, uh, then uh, I'm not going to kind of browse through it thoroughly, but just a couple of things. What you do here, you define a source, which is a separate uh, database, a legacy, the source version. This is crucial. You have to say which version you are mating from, migrating from. In this case, it was six. And then you set up, uh, the first thing we, we migrated, kind of having done all the mapping, collaboration, thinking, planning, that we did users, and that was kind of planned. Everything else depended mostly on users. And we define a users. We define some array of arguments, which are, some are pretty obvious. You define description and the machine name. And then you just, this is a static method in the migration module. A bit, one version downwards, 2.5, you just register the migration and apply those arguments you just created. And another example, it's just I would demonstrate you how you can use this as a dependency. So we had some node types, we had a source type. I've just renamed them because I can't disclose you the node types in the original system. And the destination type, so we had those types created and you just create, again, you create an array of arguments, various things you want to do, class name, description, that appears on your UI, whether you do it on uh, Drush or uh, web interface and then machine name and stuff like that. And then here and down in the bottom, we apply the user dependency. So our migration depends on a user migration. So users have to be migrated first. And then we can say afterwards, we can basically apply those users to a node. Pretty tough stuff. And then, yeah, that's it. Uh, this is probably a bit weird example, but that's again, this is taken from the example module within the Drupal to Drupal migrate, and it just allows you to, uh, to merge those users to various node types. You may register various node migrations, like not only one in this case, but many, then you just run through all of them, apply the user dependency, and then register the migration. Uh, so what we did, the other thing what we did, we, uh, we were not migrating all entities using migration. We were creating custom entities on the fly, and then you can use hooks. So there are various things which, which, uh, which kind of various processes which takes place when you create something in Drupal, users, nodes. So in this case, I use an example uh, of hook user insert. And then here is the crucial thing is this first three lines of code, four, with a comment. Uh, you have to check whether you are in the migration or not. Otherwise, if you don't do that, your, the, follow, the, the following script will probably run any time when you will create a new user. So this is just a simple check of whether, if we are in a migration, cool. And I'm just doing a negative statement because I had a lot of code following. And then I just say, if that's not set, stop, stop the script in this module. And then uh, we had another problems with data consistency and the, the validity of data. So I just used try. Uh, the type is some type, this is a bundle. As you know, entities in Drupal have types and bundles. In nodes case, entities node and types are just content types. And you have to say which type you want to create in the profile. So in this case, we were creating profile two entities. Uh, these are just descriptional way of some fields for Drupal, more fields like address, first name, surname, and things like that. And then I ran a specific function. I just put the code in a function. And then if, if, if it doesn't work, it just carries on to the next iteration. That's it. And if you uh, want to find more about that, where I took it from, this great blog post gave me a great inspiration. And this is the actual function, what I do. I just demonstrate to you that I assign some values to a, user ent to a profile entity, and then obviously I return it, so it gets created. Yep, that's basically it. And now we will talk about the tricky subject. If you want to move away from Drupal, so I think this, uh, well, this might be uh, maybe a little bit controversial, but sometimes Drupal is Alcatraz. 
Um, uh, an example of this, I think there's many people who have a Drupal-based blog and they're realizing that, well, it's a little bit too much of a hassle to have uh, a server that runs uh, Apache and PHP and all of that, where you just want to have a blog that's just read-only. Um, and so people use static site generators. The problem is how do you get your 10 years of blogging history into uh, such a system? And well, um, actually, the, the, the same thing, uh, the same thing, the same principles apply. So instead of migrating from a different system to Drupal, well, your source is Drupal. You want to do some transformation, and then you save this into, into YAML files, which is the most common standard used uh, for um, um, for for static site generators. And one thing that's well, static size generators can be pretty cool, but they don't really have that many tools for migrating. There are some scripts that are around, but you know they're of the same quality of what we showed earlier uh, as an example of how things used to be done in the past. And so the tools there are really not that great. And we happen to have the Micreate module, which is very agnostic about which sources and which targets it's used. So you can actually use the migrate module to migrate away from Drupal. So you define your source as the, your Drupal site, could be nodes, could be users, whatever you want to migrate. And then on the destination, you just save files. And then you can take those files wherever you want to go. Um, and so that's a tool I think that is pretty familiar to, to many of us. And it's a tool that actually does a great job at this. So now we have a quick checklist of what kind of things you want to make sure that you include when you're doing a migration. Um, I think the first one is make sure that you have redirects in place for any of the pages, any of the URLs that you, you used to have on your old system. Because you want any, anybody who's following a link to the old page to come to the right page on the new system. This is especially important for SEO. If your website relies heavily on, uh, on SEO and has some great content that, that bring in a lot of traffic, if you don't put this in place, you're pretty much losing the entire value of your, of your website. So you want to make sure that every single, web, uh, every single page gets redirected properly. Um, you wanted to talk? We've talked about that a lot already. Validity with data. Make sure that you, your data in both ends are valid. So the, the way well, what we mean here, basically, you have to demonstrate your customer that this, this is the data he wants. So he just comes back sometimes saying, oh, actually, we've talked, but this is, this is not the way. I, I just I don't want those fields. You have to be sure that the data you migrate. And in the smaller projects, if we demonstrated with a beer example, you can just use your own user testing. There are 16 items. You just browse through them and just compare. It's nice and easy. But there is a sandbox text module a test module available, which you can apply and use a Drupal, one of the built-in systems for testing and automated testing to run through those tables you migrated and check whether your data match with the source. That's one of the stuff. Referential integrity, make sure that all the references are created correctly. So whether your source and destinations, if there are some references in both ends, they reference at the if there are some references in the source, they reference in the destination. Integrate with other modules. Uh, there can be various stuff. So you make migration runs well, by 90% at the end, smoothly and nicely. But sometimes, obviously, you have other custom things you've built on, or things like that, to make sure that they integrate very well. String encoding, that's, we talked about that a lot. Uh, your last saving, one of the last saving kind of things is you can apply, whenever you do a field mapping, you apply a callback and you can do something with that string. Uh, this is one of the saviors just in case. And obviously when you're done with your migration, you can literally kill everything that relates to it. Just delay, disable the module, uninstall it, and probably if you don't need it, you can just remove it from your repository. You don't actually need it. If module, the migrate module is constructed and architectured in the way that it just Whatever you've migrated, if that's done, it's finished, it stays there. 
So whatever you do with the module, it doesn't do any harm to the data, to the new data. And I actually have one more um, that I, I realize we haven't covered uh, in any of our examples, and it's something that belongs in here, uh, dates. Make sure that your dates are correct because different systems use different ways of saving dates, sometimes with time zones, sometimes without time zones. And so it also, it often happens that you don't realize that everything else, well, everything that all the dates are like two hours later, uh, something like that. So you want to make sure that the, the dates match. This is something that happens pretty often. Yeah, this is, we've, We've done a small list of, of helper modules, which might help you in your migration. There are various stuffs which are already set up, like I think Migrate Extra is one of the cases. It provides some more sophisticated things to work with entity migrations. Uh, I think it has profile integration and whether, whether various other stuff. And Migrate, uh, migrate Extra is one of the things that is inspired to migrate. Uh, the inspiration is taken uh, e-commerce migration, so to migrate once some, some source to a Drupal commerce distribution. There are already modules to migrate from, away from Drupal 3, from, sorry, Typo 3, WordPress and Joomla. You just simply take them. I've demonstrated already Drupal to Drupal migration. There's a migrate redirect sandbox. This is the one I've, I've just put on this week. There is an, uh, uh, destination class that I've created, which will help you to make your, migrate your redirects. So you can take your source data and then create redirects on the fly, because redirects are entities in Drupal 7. So that's a convenient thing. And then the blogger migration, this is not kind of, it doesn't stick into a migration system, but it, it, there is a module which will help you to migrate your old blogger blog posts into a Drupal. It uses a bit different approach, but anyway, it migrates. And uh, there's a long list of other modules. Probably you may check the drupal.org forward slash project forward slash migrate. There are lots of other modules which might resolve exactly your case. If you can't do it, you may apply those examples we just showed you. And yeah, we've got a conclusion thing. So um, I think that, well, um, is anyone convinced that, well, when you need to migrate, well, you have to, I think? Anybody objects? Okay, good. Um, well, so yeah, as a conclusion, when you need to migrate, well, you have to. Um, so it's one of those things that's kind of unavoidable, but it can be fun to do as a developer. And it is also something that does not bring value to the customer directly because it is not a feature. It is something that it, it is, a, is a chore. But if you present it to the customer correctly, if you communicate it well enough, you can do so in a way that they really understand the value that they get out of this. And this is something that is very important. And the migrate module is a great solution that really facilitates doing this in a great way. Thank you. Do you have any questions? In terms of questions, any good question will be rewarded. I've got some chocolates, so <laughs> please do not. So, uh, two questions. Like, two questions like, how do you address like, referenced data? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> like, having like, two, like, two kinds of entities being referenced to each other. And the second question is like, in preparing the migration, how do you, like, can you make Estimate because migration has lots of surprises. So to, to answer the first question, the, the migrate module actually has, um, well, when you define the mapping, you can either say, I want to define a mapping between fields, or you can also say, this is actually referencing the entity created by another uh, migration. So it will, for example, if you say, well, I want to migrate this and it's, it's a reference to a user, it will look up the reference in the mapping table for the user. So you need to make sure that you import the user first. And it will actually use this to make sure that the referential integrity is there. Um, so the same way you add a mapping, and this is also something that you can do through the user interface. Um, the same way you add a mapping between fields, you can add a mapping between entities. Yeah, it's called yeah. the source migration. You apply the source. Which, yeah. from which it comes. Oh, yeah. And 
the second question uh, about um, estimates, it's, it's difficult because typically there's one end of the migration that you cannot control. Um, so you need to have a look at the data and um, I, I would, it, it is the kind of estimates where you need to have a bigger uh, buffer um, and it really helps to have a quick look at, at the data and, and see, well, look for uh, encoding, look for what is the structure of the data. So I would never make an estimate without having seen the data at least. Um, but it is something that is difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, can you say... Oh, good question. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> The, the Red Cross, how much time was? Uh, was well, the, the, the whole, I think it, I was involved in this for about three weeks. It's including planning, collaboration, and then the migration itself. It was plus minus, kind of. It, it, it really depends on the complexity of the data. Yeah, yeah follow up. Uh, Gotcha. Uh, three weeks with how many people was that, or was it just you? Uh, it was just me. It was no, we were a team of three guys, uh, a scrum master and a, and a customer side. The, the, the migration part. The migration was, part was, was just between me and the customer. We we <coughs> called them project owner in this in this project. So, so it was just only two of us chatting. Yeah, that kind of so thing. we're going to need to throw the fart. I can <laughs> oh. Oh, so, uh, so I've got two questions. Uh, what's uh, the situation with the tree collection? How, how good is the integration? Because I ran into some problems uh, about six, six months ago, and I decided to write my own code. Well, great. And uh, this is great for my code. And the second, uh, What's the best intermediate format to have? Uh, I chose MySQL, but uh, um, where do you prefer to migrate from if you have a choice? Well, the, so uh, the, the first question was about field collections. Field collections, actually, it's, it's, uh, they're entities. So it's a list of entities that each of them had fields. So if you look at the, the way it's stored in the backend, uh, I, I know there are some some scripts yeah that's that blog post this. that blog post that one yeah. of the slides we'll put this one on the on the website DrupalCon yeah. there, there is a blog post actually that blog post is about the entity uh, collection migration and it uses the hook when you insert a new entity then it creates field collections yeah. and yeah so yeah. I, I I think this is the way you do it I, so I think I typically the field collection items and uh, then I connect to them or it's or it goes in one uh, uh, basically, what what happens if you migrate? Basically, it's kind of it's a uh, it's almost a messaging thing. You create a message in the source by just creating your entity. It doesn't exist, and then you send it to Drupal, and then Drupal just uses a node create and a node save thing, and it receives those fields the, from the source, which should then be parsed to those entity uh, entity sorry field collections. Sorry. So pretty much uh, you you create. The, the entities on the fly, yep. uh, so you are not doing two step uh, two step migration because well, the, it, it's really the, the the entities attached directly to the the base entity that you are importing. Yeah. Yep. Um, and the second question, uh, if you have a choice, to okay. uh, <laughs> what's the best uh, format? Uh, MySQL or CSV? What, what do you prefer? Um, well, it's it, it, it depends on the kind of data that you have. Uh, CSV is very simple, um, but it's only it can only do things that are linear. So if you have like multiple valued fields, you cannot do this with CSV. Or you do some some crazy like multiple values inside a cell or something like that. So it's I mean it could be done, but there's really no need to to go through that. Um, so if well sometimes you can just migrate directly away from the, the original source. Uh, if you need to have an, inter uh, an intermediate format, SQL would be fine. Um, 
mapping it, use something that already has an, uh, an existing integration and use it, uh, well, see if it matches the data that, that you have. Into what kind of entity do you integrate pretty million emails? Oh. Good. Uh, so that Drupal doesn't get very slow. It, uh, well, it, it, it was a, a custom entity that, uh, that was created. So we define our own custom entity. It, the, the performance in this case was not really uh, a concern because actually all the querying were done through uh, a search, so using Apache Solar. Um, so the, the querying of the database was not a much of an issue. Okay, follow up. Um, I migrated several Rupert's fifth internal entities, something like that. Um, after three minutes, migrate goes down, but only two entities uh, per minute, every okay. single time. If I migrate, the script runs three minutes, and then the screw it's a good one. <laughs> this, <laughs> like, this is a good question, and yes, I, I'm sorry, sorry I don't have an answer. Okay. Is it, do you use a web, web, web interface or a drush? No, no, no. Drush? <coughs> no, no, no. I am every so time on module. No, no, but when you when you actually come to migration, do you do it via this migrate um, UI? Yes. Yeah. yeah, try Drush. It, you may see some equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've got a guy and then we can do, yep. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding continuous integration. Oh, would good, good one. Idea to, yeah, sure. uh, would it be a good idea to use migrate um, to migrate a dev site to a production site to uh, another a new version of the production site inside of the, the same Drupal version, just with uh, new modules that were developed during uh, the spring or so? Is it, is it possible to, to have such a framework? Is it, is it usable at that time? Um, we so it's, so to, to get the content from the production side to the staging side? Right? Yes. Um, I mean, it's could work, but generally you really want to not to get only the content, you want to get a full copy of the database. Yeah. Um, because you want to make sure that your your upgrades work, you want to make sure that everything, well, you want to have an actual copy of the live site. You don't want to just have the content. Uh, so I think that in this case, having a, an actual copy of the database would work better um, than, than just my data. So we've got two, two questions. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, you will. No, no, no. If uh, migrating from uh, older uh, websites, it's possible that uh, there would be too much uh, tags or uh, embed tags inside the text. Yeah. Could this uh, tag That's a good question. Oops, sorry. Uh, is it possible, thank you. Is it possible to move these tags away from the body where they originally belong in the source and move them inside fields? It, it, yeah. it, it would be possible, but it is in this case it is not a field that is being mapped to a field. It is a field that you take, you do some transformation, you extract the data that you want, and then you put that in a different macro. So yeah. if you want to do this, then you would, well, of course you would need to create your, your own migration, and um, there's this, uh, this method called pre-processed rows. Uh, this is on the, on the source. Uh, so you, you create your own source that's, oh, that extends whatever uh, typical source you, you have and you pre-process each of the rows using regular expressions or whatever the, the right tool would be to, to really convert, uh, to convert that data. Okay, last question. Yeah. Do you have any, any experience? We had an experience with the large sizes, like uh, 100,000 articles, it's probably relative to this question that uh, two articles in a minute. So, Good uh, one. Notice that if you, uh, if you have the sprint <coughs> running time for like two minutes, mm -hmm. will, uh, the job will uh, run only for two minutes and they can use that and each process in the import. Yeah. Uh, so if you decrease it for like uh, 10 hours, it will run for 10 hours and it will increase. Because the problem I have is that we have uh, 100,000 articles, mm -hmm. large as well with uh, Lots of content and it's a lot of database. Yeah. And uh, the SQL is complex, it takes a long time to run to get all the articles, and you can't map it to a local database. So, um, do you have any experience? 
what you do, do any special if you have like 100 tests on the so minimizing the minimizing the downtime. Yeah. Um, well, you, you can. I, I think in this case it, it's worth taking a look at uh, really what is making the system slow. So the same way you do a performance analysis for well, scalability and high traffic, you can do a performance analysis of like what what queries are making this slow. Sometimes you well wh when you save a node, typically there's a lot of things that happen. Uh, you want to save fields, you want to save images, um, and sometimes uh, the only thing that you need to migrate is not the entire node, just like the, the basic data. And this is something that, I mean, it is a performance improvement that you only need to do if you are entirely sure of this, but sometimes you can write directly to the database and get a huge performance improvement. Uh, this is, of course, something that, I mean, comes with the responsibility of writing directly to the database. So be careful with this. Um, it can actually make a, a big improvement. Yeah. yeah, that's it, guys. Thank you for coming. We've run out of time. <laughs> yeah, if, if you have more questions, we are here all week. Uh, uh, we have yeah. And please, please fill out an evaluation. We would be very happy to hear what you have to say. And I think the DrupalCon organizers also want to know. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.